One girl used to get the pay envelope for another, with Frank's knowledge. Mr. Gant swore he knew nothing of how the $2 shortage in the payroll occurred. Frank discharged him because Gant refused to make it good. In other words, he refused to take $2 out of his own wallet and give it to the factory, make up for the supposedly missing money. Because he said, I haven't stolen any money, and something's going on here, and I've done nothing wrong. So at that point, Frank discharged him. That is, he fired him. Back to the story. Gant described how Frank had behaved at 6 o'clock Saturday evening when he, Gant, went for his shoes. Standing at the front door, Gant saw Frank coming down the stairs. When Frank saw Gant, he kind of stepped back like he was going to go back, but when he looked up and saw I was looking at him, he came on out and I said, Howdy, Mr. Frank, and he sort of jumped again. Then Gant asked permission to go up for his shoes, and Frank hesitated, studied a little, inquired the kind of shoes, was told they were tans, and stated that he thought he had seen a Negro sweep them out. But when Gant said he left a black pair also, Frank studied a little bit, and told Newt to go with Gant and stay with him till he got his shoes. Gant went up and found both pairs right where he had left them. There it is. Note, in other words, no Negro had swept the shoes out. So Frank is acting suspiciously, and he's worried. He doesn't want Gant around. He had feared Gant. He was jealous of Gant. He had a feeling maybe that Gant would be very interested in what had happened to Mary Fagan not want him in the factory, looking for shoes. Quote, Mr. Frank looked pale, hung his head, and kind of hesitated and stuttered, like he didn't like me in there somehow or other, unquote. Now, this is interesting. Narrators note that both Newt Lee and J.M. Gant, the uh, Black Knight Watchman and the White Fired Employee, are both using the same expression, he hung his head, kind of like he was beaten or he knew he'd done something stupid. He was dejected and depressed and maybe feeling doomed, <laughs> like he was in serious trouble. That same detail. And Gant says he kind of hesitated and stuttered. Well, again, the detectives are saying he acted pale, he looked pale, he acted very nervous, just acting oddly. And, of course, this is extremely important because, again, this is a capital case. This is a case, you know, with the rape and murder of a little girl. Somebody's going to hang. So, uh, you know, people can tend to act rather nervously when they feel that they're in huge trouble. Back to the story. Watson remarks, on the strength of what Frank insinuated against Gant, he was arrested before Frank was and was not released until Thursday night. Back to the testimony. Mrs. J.A. White, sworn for the state, narrator's note, she was the wife of a man who worked in carpentry at the factory, and she was in there to see her husband. Repeating, Mrs. J.A. White, sworn for the state. There is note, that is, she was testifying for the prosecution, which was prosecuting Leo Frank, for a prosecutor or solicitor, Hugh Dorsey. Mrs. J.A. White, sworn for the state, said that she went to the factory to see her husband, who was at work there on April 26th. There is note, of course, the day of the murder. She went at 11.30 a.m. and stayed until 11.50 when she left. She returned about 12.30 and saw Frank standing before the safe in his outer office. I asked him if Mr. White, narrator's note, that is her husband, had gone back to work. He jumped like I surprised him and turned and said, yes, unquote. She went upstairs to see her husband. So her husband and the others in the carpentry crew, they're working on the higher floor. They were very far away from the scene of the rape and murder. The only people who were there were, <laughs> was, was Leo Frank was at the scene of the murder <laughs> at that end of the building and on that floor. Repeating, she went upstairs to see her husband, and while she was up there, about 1 o'clock, Frank came up and told Mr. White that if she wanted to get out before 3 o'clock, she'd better come down as he was going to leave and lock the door, that she'd better be ready by the time he could get his coat and hat. Mrs. White testified to this incredibly important fact. As I was going on down the steps, I saw a Negro sitting on a box close to the stairway on the first floor. Mr. Frank did not have his coat or hat on when I passed out. Unquote. On cross-examination, this lady swore, I saw a Negro sitting 
between the stairway and the door, about five or six feet from the foot of the stairway. Unquote. While Mrs. White was talking to her husband between 11.30 and 11.50, she saw Miss Corinthia Hall and Mrs. Emma Freeman there, and they left before she did. Watson remarks, Mrs. White did not work at the factory and did not know Jim Connolly. The place where she saw a Negro sitting was where Jim sat when he had nothing else to do. Picture to yourself the interior of the factory as Mrs. White departs at about one o'clock that fateful Saturday. Two carpenters are at work on the fourth floor, tearing out a partition and putting up a new one, and they are 40 feet back from the elevator. Frank is sitting on the second floor, near the head of the stairs, and Jim Conley is seated at the foot of the same stairs, on the floor below, not more than 30 feet from his white boss. The lady passes on out, leaving these two men practically together. There is no, in other words, they're basically at the top of the bottom of the same flight of stairs. According to his own statement to the police officers, Frank has already had Mary Fagan in his office, in his possession, between the first departure of Mrs. White at 11.50 and her second coming at 12.30. Frank's own admission put the girl alone with him in his private office shortly after the noon hour. And when Mrs. White returns at 30 minutes after the noon hour, the girl is nowhere to be seen. Who can account for Mary between these times? And who can account for Frank? Here is the tragedy. Hemmed within the first departure and the second arrival of Mrs. White, a space which could not be filled by any two human beings, excepting Jim Conley and Leo Frank. Watson remarks, we shall see later how each of the two filled it. Back to the testimony. Harry Scott, the state's next witness, was superintendent of the local branch of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. He was employed by Frank for the pencil factory. Narrator's note, as I've explained in earlier audiobooks, in the old days, you did not have government investigative agencies such as the FBI and so forth. You had private detective agencies. They were hired. Uh, a lawyer might hire them to try to prove his client's innocence. The government might hire detectives to prove that somebody was guilty. And they would, if they had a good reputation as detectives, then they were busy. It's a, it was a big business at the time. Once the FBI and other investigative agencies of the government were created, uh, their work uh, declined, the work of private detectives. And then you had basically government detectives and uh, investigative bureaus such as the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which became big in the 1920s. But this is before all that time. Back then, private detectives were the experts that people turned to, such as Pinkerton, so the William Burns Agency, and so forth. I'll repeat, Harry Scott, the state's next witness, was superintendent of the local branch of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. He was employed by Frank for the pencil factory. In Frank's private office, Monday afternoon, April 28th, narrator's note, that is, two days after the murder, the detective heard Frank's detailed account of his movements the Saturday before. Frank told him he was going to Montag's at his uncle, Sigmund Montag, and of the coming of Mrs. White. Quote, he then stated that Mary Fagan came into the office at 12.10 p.m. to draw her pay, that she had been laid off the Monday previous, and she was paid $1.20, that he paid her off in his inside office where he was at his desk, and when she left his office and went into the outer office, she had reached the outer office door leading into the hall and turned around to Mr. Frank and asked if the medal had come yet. Mr. Frank replied that he didn't know and that Mary Fagan, he thought, reached the stairway, and he heard voices, but he couldn't distinguish whether they were men or girls talking. End of quote. Later, a witness stated that it was before Mary came that Frank said he heard voices, before 12 o'clock. Watson remarks, Let me explain that Mary worked on Frank's floor some distance back of his office, then she placed metal tips on the pencils. The supply of this metal gave out, and more was ordered, but in the meantime, Mary was unemployed. Her question, has the medal come, was therefore equivalent to asking, will there be work for me next Monday? In other words, in two more days. Note particularly that in his private conference with his own detective, Leo Frank did not pretend that he had not known Mary Fagan. On the contrary, see what Scott says further on. Back to the testimony. Quote, 
He, Frank, also stated during our conversation that Gant knew Mary Fagan very well. There was no... Okay, so at first, when the <laughs> cops come to his house and they're riding with him in the car to the factory. He says he doesn't know who Mary Fagan is. But then when he's talking with his own detective, Scott, of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, he says Gant knew Mary Fagan very well. Well, obviously, Leo Frank knew his own employee, the bookkeeper, and he knew that his bookkeeper knew Mary Fagan. Well, if he didn't know who Mary Fagan was, how did... He knew that Gant knew her. Inconsistent. Okay, repeating. He, Frank, also stated during our conversation that Gant knew Mary Fagan very well, that he was familiar and intimate with her. He seemed to lay special stress on it at the time. He said that Gant paid a good deal of attention to her. Watson remarks angrily at this point, the morning before, he did not know her and had to consult his paybook. Although he had passed within three feet of her Every day when he went to use the toilet and paid her off every week for about a year, he did not know any girl of that name. End of Watson's remark. I mean, Watson hates the guy. This guy's a liar. I mean, everything was based on lies. He lied constantly in every detail. Back to the testimony. Mr. Herbert J. Haas, later the chairman of the Frank Finance Committee, near his note, that is, the committee to raise money for the top lawyers that Leo Frank had hired the next day, <laughs> knowing suspicion was going to fall on him. Repeating, Mr. Herbert J. Haas, later the chairman of the Frank Finance Committee, told the detective to report to him first before letting the public know, quote, what evidence we had gathered, unquote. We told him we would withdraw from the case before we would adopt any practice of that sort. Near it is no. Okay, so here you see that an ethical detective, a private detective agency, is not going to be colluding with defense lawyers or with the accused. Their reputation would be destroyed. Detectives were hired based upon the public's belief and the prosecutor's belief and everyone's belief that a detective was going to testify to the truth. So they had their own reputation to worry about as well as possibly some ethical concerns that to do the right thing. An honest detective wanted to be trusted by the public. And if he got up on the stand to testify to evidence and things he had found out, we would hope the jury would believe him. He didn't want to be known as a crooked detective. So I'll repeat this paragraph. Mr. Herbert J. Haas, later the chairman of the Frank Finance Committee, told the detective, in other words, a detective hired by Leo Frank, to report to him first before letting the public know Quote, what evidence we had gathered. We told him we would withdraw from the case before we would adopt any practice of that sort. Narrator's note, in other words, they weren't going to have a little conference with Frank's defense lawyer about whether they were going to say what they had found out. They weren't going to hide the evidence that they were digging up. Back to the testimony. Scott asked Frank to use his influence as employer with Newt Lee and tried to get him to tell what he knew. Frank consented, and the two were put in the private room in order that Frank might get something out of the, quote, tall, slim night watch, unquote. Quotation from Detective Scott of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. When about ten minutes was up, Mr. Black and I entered the room, and Lee hadn't finished his conversation with Frank, and was saying, Mr. Frank, it's awful hard for me to remain handcuffed to this chair. And Frank hung his head the entire time the Negro was talking to him. And finally, in about 30 seconds, he said, Well, they've got me too. After that, we asked Mr. Frank if he had gotten anything out of the Negro, and he said, No, Lee still sticks to his original story. Mr. Frank was extremely nervous at that time. He was very squirmy in his chair, crossing one leg after the other, and didn't know where to put his hands. He was moving them up and down his face, and he hung his head a great deal of the time while the Negro was talking to him. He breathed very heavily and took deep swallows and hesitated somewhat. His eyes were about the same as they are now. Narrator's note, I'd like to emphasize here that uh, the Pigarden Detective Agency was, was hired 
by Leo Frank's defense, but of course they became enraged when the head of the finance committee said, you know, talk with us first, you know, we want to know what you're finding out, and we want to get together with you in terms of what you're going to be saying here. Uh, so the figure, Scott became enraged at this, and so he's really testifying against his former client about how nervous he was and rubbing his face and hanging his head as the black guy talked to him. You know, basically he was trying to frame this black guy for his, the rape and murder he had committed. I mean, you know, in those days, especially a black, anybody, white or black, but especially a black man who raped and killed a little white girl, it's certain death, certain death. Maybe he felt guilty or ashamed. Now, Leo Frank was certainly no angel, but it seemed that he was quite troubled by something at least.